Go with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. And another place the Lord Jesus has told us that it is better to give than to receive. And that is always true, but it does not always feel true. And whether it feels true or not is based pretty significantly on how those we give gifts to respond. So as you think back to the most wonderful responses your gifts have received, perhaps you imagine the child screaming in joy that they got that bike or game or toy that they wanted, or the sudden and immediate tears of joy and love that well up in their eyes as they realize how thoughtful this gift was. Or maybe it's the quiet, knowing look between spouses as they secretly give each other gifts as their kids run and scream and play. Our responses to our gifts can be incredibly moving and captivating and emotional, or they can be something else entirely. And as I spent time with Sarah's family this week, I heard a story just like that. I shared this with her permission for the record. When Sarah was five years old, she had a birthday party. Her family had just moved to Missouri. They didn't know anyone very well. And the pastor of their church, his wife, brought a wonderful, large, elaborate baby doll set to try and help Sarah feel loved and included. But if you know Sarah, she wasn't a big fan of baby dolls. And so she opened the present, and in classic Sarah fashion, she opened it and said, I don't want this. And as everyone just stared at her in shock, she said, I was very clear, I don't want this. Who gave me this? and then set it aside and reached for another one. That pastor's wife didn't feel great <laughs> about giving in that moment. How we respond to the gifts we give, that our gifts, the gifts our family gives us is important, but how we respond to the gift of God is far more important. And as bad as my wife's responses, we're gonna see even worse responses to the gift of Christ in Matthew 2. My hope is that as we study this passage, we will be moved to respond to the truth of God's word in worship. So would you pray with me as we begin our study this morning? Father, we are thankful that you are the giver of all good gifts, that you love us deeply and perfectly and purely, and that you give us what we need. And when we long for you, you give us the desires of our hearts. And so we pray, help us desire you in this time. Help us desire to know you. God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Before we talk about the responses we see in Matthew 2, I think it's important to be reminded of what they are responding to, which we see in Matthew 1. Matthew was a Jewish man writing to a Jewish audience about the kingdom of God, and in chapter 1, he tells them about the birth of their king. The first 18, or I'm sorry, 17 verses are the king's lineage. In verse 18, he tells us about the birth of the king. So let us read verses 18 to 24. There we read, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold! An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Joseph woke from sleep. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. This is a wonderful miracle, which we often overlook because we are used to it. We just read of the birth of a fully human child, the adopted son of Joseph, and the physical descendant of Abraham, David, and Mary. We read about the birth of a fully divine child, conceived by the Holy Spirit and named God with us. We read of the birth of the Christ, the Messiah. These are two words that mean the same thing, anointed one. He is the promised one 
whom all the prophets spoke about who would save his people from their sins. All this Matthew sums up in chapter 2, verse 1 by saying, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And to this birth, which we celebrate today and tomorrow, this weekend, we see three responses in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. So as we read chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, look for how people respond to this news. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, Oh, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and going into the house they saw the child with Mary his mother and they fell down and worshipped him then opening their treasures they offered him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod they departed to their own country by another way we see three responses to the birth of the Christ the first is the response of Herod the king. Well, who was Herod? Known to history as Herod the Great, he was proclaimed king of the Roman province of Judea in 40 BC. He got that position through military might, political maneuvers, and over the last 40-ish years of his reign, he had rebuilt the temple and done many wonderful things, but he had also severely oppressed the people and taxed them and violently opposed them. He was hated by his subjects and overwhelmed with paranoia. At this point, he had already killed many of his own family members for fear that they would overthrow him. So when these wise men from the east come and say, hey, who is, where is the, the son born king? Where is this child? Herod is unsurprisingly fearfully angry. And he's fearfully angry at the child's authority. Look again to verse 2. Where the wise men ask Herod, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For he saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. <clears throat> Notice this child was born king of the Jews. Herod was not born king of the Jews. He was declared by their oppressors. How do they know this child was born king? Well, Herod finds out later in the passage he was born in Bethlehem meaning he was of the lineage of David. God had promised David that his descendant would sit on the throne of Israel forever. This child was the rightful heir to the throne that Herod had stolen. Herod would have been terrified by this news, but it was far worse news because not only had he been born king, they say they saw his star when it rose. Not a star, but his star. Somehow, this light in the sky belonged to this child. And we don't know how that works. It was miraculous in some way. But what we do know is that in ancient Rome, the sky was the authority over who was reigning. When there was a new emperor, they would see a star. When that emperor's time to go, the star would disappear. God is not a fan of astrology, but he spoke to these astrologers through the stars. So while the emperor may have declared Herod as king, creation itself was declaring this child was king. And this would have been even scarier for Herod if he knew his Bible well, which he had some idea, but probably not a very good idea, because this star is a fulfillment of the prophecy from Numbers 24. Numbers 24, a wicked king hires a false prophet to 
speak lies about Israel. And when the prophet goes to do this, God, through his spirit, fills the prophet and instead speaks blessings upon Israel. I think the most amazing part of that prophecy is verses 16 to 18, which we have here on the screen. Balaam, this evil prophet who's, got, who's, uh, who's filled with the spirit of God and speaks truth, says, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. This is quite the prophecy. God gives this false prophet a vision of a star which would rise out of Israel and then describes the star with the term scepter, which is a reference to Genesis 49 when God promised that Judah would always have the scepter of Israel. A king would always reign from the line of Judah. And to Genesis 3, we see the reference of crushing the forehead. This is the very first promise of Messiah, that God would send a promised one to crush the serpent's head and deliver his people. And notice that last line, this star would dispossess Edom. King Herod was an Edomite. He was from the lineage of Edom. So this, again, he probably didn't know this prophecy very well. But he should have been terrified. He knew enough to be scared. He knew a descendant of David had been born. He knew that this child had been declared king by the stars. And he knew it was the Christ. He asked them, where will the Christ be born? He knows the Christ, or at least one claiming to be the Christ, has come to rule and reign and deliver, which means Herod has just been told that your right to decide your own life, your right to be on your own throne, your right to rule is gone. You have someone else you must submit to. Herod was fearfully angry at the child's authority and at the child's acclaim, his worship, that he was uh, loved so dearly. Verse 2, the wise men say, they came for we saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. This is shocking if we are, again, not used to the story. These wise men come from so far away and they stand in Herod's palace. Imagine this amazing palace with all the gold and the soldiers and the army and he's on his big throne and he's showing off all his power and these guys say, hey, uh, we want to worship someone else. Herod is furious. Verse 3 says he was troubled. And this verse, I think sometimes the word troubled in English doesn't really sound all that bad. Uh, but this word is used elsewhere in Scripture of the fear and terror experience when people see an angel of God. They don't look like precious moments figurines. Sorry to crush your dreams. They are terrifying. It's the same word used to describe Jesus' anger at the unbelief of those around him. It's the same word used to describe the deep sorrow and pain and agony he endured as he prepared for his crucifixion. So Herod is deeply angry and sorrowful and fearful. Why? Because a child is getting what he most wants, worship. Because in all our hearts, in our sin, what we most want is to be worshiped, to be praised, to be honored, to have glory. And notice that all Jerusalem was troubled with him. This is not because they felt bad for Herod and they loved him so much. This is because they knew when Herod doesn't get what he wants, everyone around him suffers. And so we see that this led to agony. Herod attempted to use the wise men as spies. God warned them in a dream to go another way. Then he warns Joseph. Look ahead to verse 13. We read, now when the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And that's exactly what happened. In Herod's foolish anger, he sent men to kill all the male children in Bethlehem and all the surrounding region. His fearful anger brought agony to many families, not just himself, but to everyone around him. And he ended up suffering and agony himself. We know from history he died alone in great shame and in horrible pain from his many diseases. And he will suffer in the just fires of hell forever because not just his slaughter of innocent children, but most centrally because of his rejection of the king, of the child-born king. Herod gives us an example of one way to respond to the birth of Jesus. We can be fearful of his authority. Because Jesus being born king means we are not king. We don't get to decide 
how to live our life. Jesus being acclaimed and worshipped means deep down we are not worthy of acclaim and worship. But friends, if we reject the king, it will lead only to agony. Because Jesus has been born, and he has been born king. Herod could not stop him, and neither can you. He is already king of your life. Philippians 2 says that no matter what happens, at the name of Jesus, every knee should or will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The question is not, will Jesus be your king? The question is, will you confess Jesus as your king in joy or in agony? You will confess him as king one way or the other. In this life or the next, you will confess him as king. But your choice is, will you do it in joy and submission, or you do it in suffering and judgment? Friend, if you are here today and you have been fearful or angry at God's claim of authority in your life, you have nothing to fear if you will submit to the king. As we read in chapter 1, Jesus came to save his people from their sins. He is not a tyrant like Herod. He has come to save if you will submit. But if you will not submit, there will be agony. There will be suffering. But if you bow, if you confess that he deserves all honor and glory and power, you can be saved. God has given the gift of Jesus, the star of Jesse, the scepter of Judah, the son of David. Will you respond in faith today? Herod responded in fearful anger. But not everyone responded like Herod. We also see the response of the chief priests and the scribes. Well, who were these men? King Herod was the political leader of Israel. These men were the religious leaders of Israel. They were respected and honored. They were held up as the most holy men in all the earth. But, in reality, their holiness was only outward. They didn't care about God. They just wanted what they could get from God and from his people. And they are like many today who call themselves Christians, perhaps even some in this room. How did they respond to the birth of Christ? Well, we see that they were foolishly apathetic about God's prophecies. Look again to verses 4 to 6. Herod, assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him. In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For you shall come, uh, from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. I was honestly a little convicted when I read this. Because when Herod asked them a question, they don't have to Google it. I mean, they just knew. These men, by the certainty of their position, they would have had the entire first five books of the Bible memorized word perfect. All 187 chapters, they can just reference it off the top of their head. That was required to have this job. They also would have known the rest of the scriptures very, very well, which is why when Herod asked them, man, they know the answer. But what I want us to understand is though they knew the answer, they did not care about the answer. And to see the depth of their apathy, we have to see the depth of their knowledge, what they knew about the Christ. Because I think sometimes we think, oh, they, they knew where. But that's a big deal that they knew where he was going to be born. Bethlehem is six miles from Jerusalem. You can easily walk that in a day. I mean, maybe we can't today because we're used to cars. But back then, that's much less than a day's journey. They easily could have gone to Bethlehem and checked. They knew where and they knew when. In Daniel 9, God spoke through Daniel and said, 70 weeks are decreed from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one. Literally, the word weeks in this passage is the word sevens. This was a common way to refer to periods of seven years, which means God revealed to Israel through Daniel that from the day was decreed to rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, the Messiah, would be 490 years. And that promised decree went out 490 years before Christ was born. We could spend hours on the details of this prophecy. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, like Jewish and Roman calendars comparing all these different things. I, I called Pastor Gary Gilly for advice on how to explain that, and his advice was don't do that on Christmas Eve. So we're not going to do that. I know we all want to go home at some point. For the sake of today, let's just say that if nothing else, the priests knew they were living in the time period when the Messiah was supposed to come. They knew this. 
And this is confirmed by outside sources, outside the scriptures. Josephus, a Roman historian, said of the Jews at this time period that they had an oracle, likewise found in their sacred scriptures, to the effect that at that time, one from their country would become ruler of the world. The Romans knew, the Jews knew, that the Messiah was to come in this time period. They knew where he was to be born, and they knew when. And they also knew who. In verse 6, the priests quote, from Micah 5 to but they cut off the end of the verse and replaced it with something else. They edited the prophecy in Micah to include a quote from 2 Samuel 5. I think this was like a dig at Herod, which again, as a side note, we don't have time to get into. But the part they cut off, it's on the screen. The verse originally ended with, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Micah is speaking of the Christ's divinity, godhood. Because this promised ruler that he speaks of will be from of old and from ancient days. And there's, friends, there's only one who is the ancient of days in the Old Testament. God himself. There's only one who is from of old. These words, another way to translate them is eternal, everlasting. Jesus was not born and created on Christmas Day. He took on flesh and was born, but he existed beforehand. He has existed from eternity. He is a member of the Trinity. As the Athanasian Creed says, we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time, and he is human from the essence of his mother, born in time, completely God, completely human. This ruler from Bethlehem, the star and scepter would not only be human, he would be both human and God. It seems the Pharisees did not like this because they edited it out of their message to Herod. But whether they intentionally ignored it or not, they knew what the verses said and they should have known what it meant. Which means you would think that they would have some priests at the birth of every single child in Bethlehem. Like that would be someone's full-time job is to just check like, hey, is this baby the Messiah? Is this baby the Messiah? Is... What else are they doing? What else is more important than finding God-made flesh? And yet we see the depth of their apathy, both about God's prophecies and about his purpose for their lives. For we see it says, he, Herod inquired of them whether Christ was to be born, and they just told him, which, you know, telling the evil, wicked, murdering king where the next king is, not a great plan if you support the king. And on top of that, they do that, and then they do absolutely nothing else. They don't show up again in Matthew until chapter 21, which is over 30 years later. They didn't go follow the wise men. Seems like a reason. I mean, there's a lot of priests. They could have sent one guy, right? They could have followed the priests, the, the wise men. They could have gone to Bethlehem and talked to the shepherds. They could have talked to their own people in the temple, like Zechariah or his wife Elizabeth or Simeon or Anna or anyone else who had seen and heard these wonderful things. They had so many opportunities to hear from God. And we don't hear from them again until chapter 21 when Jesus comes to the temple. And we read, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Like, that's the only thing he said, yeah. And then he quotes scripture, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. I don't want to be unfair to the priests. I don't want to be unfair to the priests. It, it's hard to believe that some seemingly random baby is God made flesh. That's tough. I get it. But he's here in the temple. He's healing the blind, which has never been done before. He's receiving the worship of Israel's people in Israel's temple, and he's accepting it. And nothing bad is happening to him. He is clearly God. He's clearly the Messiah. The priests should have been leading the singing. That was their job, is to lead in the worship of, of God. The scribes should have been like, hey, Micah 5 and Isaiah 60, and this verse, and this verse. Look at how he's fulfilling all these prophecies. That was their job, their purpose. But instead, they confront him, and they condemn him, and this leads to their punishment. Priests and scribes attempted to verbally trap Jesus over and over again so they could discredit him for two chapters. And then we, in chapter 21, Jesus responds. He says, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? 
This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. I want to be very clear. The kingdom was not taken away from them because they were not producing fruit. That's legalism. It's dangerous. The kingdom was taken away from them because they did not see what the Lord was doing as marvelous. Their God, our God, the God of the universe, was born in a stable. Then he lived a sinless and perfect life, doing miracles to confirm who he was. He took on flesh. He was obedient even to the point of death. He took the debt and sin that we owed and died on a cross for it, and then he rose from the dead in a glorified body as a promise of life to come for those who believe in him. That should lead us to marvel at the Christ child. Friends, do you marvel at what God has done? Or do you just apathetically know the prophecies of the Old Testament? And you're not really that concerned about it. You know the New Testament fulfilled all those prophecies, and the Christ calls you to a greater purpose in life. But you decide to live for other things. Friends, this will lead only to punishment. The sovereign God was born in human flesh for you. Like our question of the priests and scribes, what else could be more important than that? Nothing. What else is more marvelous? Yes, your marriage and your kids, they're great. I'm so glad you have your family. And your career and your hobbies and your entertainment, they're fun and fulfilling. Glad you have those too. Your reputation, your respect in the community are high. That's great. But God was born and died for you. That should matter more. Nothing else matters compared to this. To be apathetic about this truth or to be focused on anything else is the height of foolishness. Peter picks up the same language in his first letter when he tells us that we as Christians are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's the same word, and I think intentionally the same word. As Christians, God has given us the kingdom to produce its fruits. That's why we're chosen and possessed and made priests and kings and holy. It's so that here's why, here's the purpose, we would proclaim the excellencies of Christ. Because he called us out of darkness into marvelous light. So we have to ask, is that our purpose in life? Is that the main driving force of everything that we do? Are we looking deeply into his word to see the prophecies made and fulfilled? Are we proclaiming his marvelous glory is at the foundation of our schedule and our budgets. Would other people know that we say that's the most important thing to us? Could they tell that by the way we live? Is our work as priest and proclaimer the most important role in our life? Friends, especially this week, we are going to be with our families, and they can't really get out of it. That's not the best way to say it, but like you're with your families. What is your primary goal? Is it to have fun or to get presents or is it to proclaim Christ? I pray that that would be our primary focus. Let us talk about the marvelous works of God. Let us be bold in sharing the gospel. Let us be willing even to lose things for the sake of the gospel. I pray, may we put off foolish apathy, dedicate ourselves ever more fully to proclaiming the marvelous light of the one born king. I'm thankful we have a good example of what that looks like in the wise men and their response to Jesus' birth. Who are these wise men? Well, tradition says there were three of them, and they were kings. Probably neither of those things are accurate. That's just church tradition. The actual history is a little more complicated. These men are called magi. That was the primary counselors or instructors or teachers, the governmental authorities of the Parthian Empire, the Eastern Empires. They probably arrived as part of a very large caravan, which part of why Herod was nervous, because this big old caravan from a rival empire showed up. And it must be understood, these men are not Jewish, either by blood or religion. Their work was as astrological interpreters of the stars for pagan rulers. But God, in his infinite grace, chose to reveal the birth of Christ to them as they watched the sky. And they responded in faithful adoration, and they searched for the Christ. Look again to verses 1 and 2. I love the way Matthew starts. He says, Behold, because he wants us to pay attention. Behold! Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. 
Why does he tell us the direction? Why does it matter they came from the east? Because in biblical historical narratives, the east is the bad direction. It's where bad things come from. It's where bad things go. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and sent east. Assyria, who destroyed Israel, came from the east. Judah was taken into captivity in the east. And so these men come from the east, the place of evil and wickedness. And on top of that, Matthew reminds us they're magi. They practice dark arts. They read the skies. They sin with astrology. They do all these things. These magi are the least likely to be saved that his Jewish readers could possibly imagine. But they are the ones searching for Messiah. When no one, I mean, they show up in Jerusalem, they're like, hey, clearly all of you are searching for the king. Where is he? And no one else was doing it. Only the Magi searched for the king. Look again to verses 9 and 10. After listening to the king, that is, I mean, listening to him lie, really, they went on their way. Behold, the star they had, been, they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And then these Magi from the east, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Our hope to rejoice exceedingly with great joy this Christmas, no matter who we are or what we have done, we may be the furthest from God we could possibly imagine. You may have been an astrologer practicing dark arts. You may be shocked that when you walked in here, the building didn't catch fire. But friends, if you go searching for Jesus, you will find him. Not because you are great at searching, but because the star they followed led them directly to Christ. By God's grace, you don't have to watch the skies. He has sent you not a star, but his holy and complete word. He has brought you to a church where the gospel is read and sung and preached and practiced. He has brought you to a gathering house where the child, now the risen Lord, resides and is worshipped. And like the wise men, you don't need to do anything before you're allowed to see him. They didn't have to go to the temple. They didn't have to be circumcised. They didn't have to be purified. They show up in their eastern garb and they walk in to see Jesus. As John said in his first letter, if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, you don't need to be sinless before you meet Christ. He just calls you to confess that you're not. You don't need to be perfect or faithful or just. He's got that covered. You don't need to clean yourself up or do righteous deeds. He's promised to provide those things for you. You don't need to be better before you come to Christ, but you must come to him. The wise men found salvation because they left their home and followed the star. Friends, you can't be passive. You can't wait around. You must search. You must come to Christ. No matter who you are or what you have done, you can rejoice today with exceedingly great joy because God has revealed himself to you through the word and he offers you complete and lasting forgiveness for all your sins if you will just come to him. Whether you've never found Jesus before, perhaps you are one of his children who's been walking away and you need to repent. If you seek him, you will find him because God will lead you to him. The wise men faithfully adored this child-born king and they searched for him and we see when they found him, they submitted to him. Again, verse 11, going into the house, they saw the child with his mother. They fell down and worshiped him. I think we need to remember, again, this is six miles away. So earlier that day, most likely, they were in Jerusalem in the palace of Herod. Amazingly glorious, probably better than any building we've ever been in. Gold everywhere, soldiers everywhere, power everywhere. He's on his throne. They leave that place and they come to a very poor house where they meet a very poor father and mother and they see a very normal child. He did not have a halo. He was not glowing. He was not doing miracles. Depending on when this actually happened, he may have been walking or completely unable to move on his own. And when they see this babbling, cooing, crying child like any other child, what do these great men do? They bow down and worship a toddler or baby. As much as I love that we are familiar with the Christmas story, I think at times our familiarity leads us to gloss over how incredible that is. 
Imagine the presidents of the United States and China, the Secretary of the UN and the European Union all showed up to some low income apartment here in town, walked in the door, they got their limos and all their soldiers outside setting a perimeter, and they walk up to this child and they bow down not only to honor him despite their greatness, they worship him as God made flesh. They worship an unspeaking child as the one who spoke the universe into existence. That is amazing. And it shows their humility. And it is the way to rejoicing in exceedingly great joy. Joy is found in humility. In fact, Jesus told us that's why he came and gave us commandments. In John 15, he said, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that, so that, here's why I said all this, my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. Jesus is not a tyrant like Herod. He does not demand submission because he's afraid of what you might do if you don't submit. He does not want you to submit because it works out better for him and he can tax you. His rule is not based on fear. Jesus calls us to submit for the express purpose of bringing us joy, of making our life better. I'm reminded of how our little ones respond when we tell them to take a nap. They are tired and they're angry because they're tired, and they're cranky because they're tired. If they would just go to sleep, everyone would be so much happier. There might be a little bit of selfishness in that, but like, just, just go to sleep. Please listen to me. I, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Go to sleep, and you will be joyful when you wake up. And what do our children do? Cry and freak out and panic because they don't trust it. They think they know better. We do the same thing to God. Jesus says, if you obey me, if you follow me, you will have joy. And we say, I know better than you. I'm not going to submit. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to live the way I want to live. I'm going to design my life the way I want. And friends, it's foolishness. The only path to joy is submission. Jesus is the one who made us. He knows how we work. He knows what is best for us. And he calls us to listen to him for the sake of joy. So no matter what you've been doing or how you've been living, Jesus offers you a life of rejoicing and exceedingly great joy. And the path is simple. So kids, look right at me. When your parents tell you to take a nap today or tomorrow, just, just do it. They love you. They care for you. They want the best for you. And God does the same thing. And if you don't have to, I'm not telling you you have to take a nap. Just listen to your parents is the point, okay? Listen to your parents. They love you. And listen to God. He loves you. Bryn's giving me a thumbs up, so I'm glad. Yeah, God loves you. And he wants the best for you. Listen to God. And for the adults, the same thing is true for us. What areas of our life are we refusing to submit to Christ's authority? Are we doing our marriage our own way? Our parenting our own way? Are we deciding how involved we want to be in the church, but it's up to us? Are we, friends, are there areas of secret sin in our life? Jesus offers us everlasting joy and infinite love if we will just submit to him. You cannot have a life better than the one he's designed and the one he has declared clearly in his word. Any other path leads to suffering, but submission to God leads to life. He is worthy of our worship and worthy of obedience. That was true when he was a child. How much more as the ascended Lord? The wise men saw the child. They submitted in worship. But this worship was not merely with words. They gave gifts and showed that they were sure of him. They were trusting in him. They had faith in him. Look at verse 11. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Not Frankenstein, as I've heard our kids talk about. Frankincense. It's a different thing. How do we know that these men were sure of the, the Christ child? Well, because of the gifts. I think they chose these gifts because they were sure of his identity, and they understood what the Scripture said. They'd been studying them. They gave him gold, which is obviously not only valuable, but it was the customary gift to kings. You gave gold when you visited a king. They are declaring, we know, though you are a child, you are the king of all the earth. They gave him frankincense which is a very expensive incense. It was used in temples. It was connected to divinity. To give someone that is to reference God. They were declaring that this child was divine, worthy of worship. 
And third, they gave him myrrh. This was a balm used in medicines and used as an embalming fluid to prepare dead bodies for burial. Not only did they know he was God, I think to some extent they knew he was fully human and they may have known he would die. The Christmas hymn summarizes it well. Glorious now, behold him rise, King and God and sacrifice. These gifts are an incredible display of how sure their faith was. It would have been one thing if they'd showed up to Israel and they saw Jesus on the throne, having already been resurrected, already redeemed his people, already accomplished everything, and they're like, hey, let's worship this guy. He clearly deserves it. That's not what happened. They showed up, they found a baby. As far as they knew, again, a regular looking baby. And still, they worshiped. Still, they declared him king and God and sacrifice. Friends, in the same way, we must be sure of Jesus today. He is God incarnate. He was the perfect sacrifice. But like the wise men, we are still waiting to see his kingdom come fully and finally. They waited for his first coming. We long for his second. And again, John, Jesus tells us how we can be comforted even in seasons like this. Christmas is hard for many people. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Same word from Herod. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. To the watching world, hoping in the promise of, of Jesus coming back may seem as foolish and pointless as bowing down before a baby. I don't care what the world says. We must be sure that he is coming back. His promises are true. We can be confident he is who he claimed to be because the word of God declares him to be so. How does our sure faith in these help our hearts not be troubled? Well, when we miss that believing loved one in our celebrations this week, they've been taken by death and we long to see them again, we can be sure we will see them again when Christ returns. When we feel crushed under the weight of another year of suffering and struggling, we can be sure that Jesus is preparing a better place for us. When we feel lonely and empty and hopeless, we can be sure that Jesus will come back and take us to himself, not come back and dump us in some big empty house. He will take us to himself. We will be with him forever in unimaginable comfort and fellowship and love. Friends, this is why the wise men could be content to go back to their homeland because they were sure that everything promised about the Messiah was true. They didn't need to see the kingdom with their eyes. They had faith. In the same way, we can go back to our homes today in faith. And we can rejoice in exceedingly great joy, not because of presence or family or traditions, but because the one who is born king is coming back to make that kingdom a full reality. Friends, how will you respond to God's great gift? If you need to be saved, speak with me or someone else here. We would love to talk with you about that. If you need to repent of sin, we'd love to talk with you about that. And Jesus stands ready to save you. Don't wait until he comes back. Repent now. I pray that we would search for him, submit to him, and be sure of his return. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful that your word is true. We are thankful that it foretold the Christ child, that the Gospels tell us of how he lived and loved and died and rose. And that the epistles tell us of how to live in light of that truth. And that revelation tells us in, in much detail how you will come back and rule and reign. We long for that day. We pray for the return of Christ. We love Christmas. But God, I, I would much rather celebrate Christmas with you in heaven. We pray you would come back even today. But if you don't, if we have another year, if 2024 flips over to 2025, God, may we be found faithful 
sure of your promises and longing for your return. God, work in our hearts. Help us respond in joy to your gift. In Jesus' name, amen.